Um, before proceeding to the presentations, as Gwen said, I would like to give a short introduction on what open air is, uh, what we do, and the different ways in which we can support you. Um, open air uh, started in 2008. Um, at that time, uh, it aimed mainly at uh, supporting the open access pilot in um, FP7. Uh, currently, we have a much wider um, a vision and mission, which is to um, uh, shift the scholarly communication towards uh, openness and transparency and to facilitate innovative uh, ways to communicate and monitor uh, research. Uh, while doing so, we work with a variety of stakeholders like uh, policy makers, content uh, providers, research uh, support staff, um, IT experts, uh, legal experts as well, and obviously um, uh, researchers. And we provide a variety of uh, services uh, and tools uh, to support all these uh, stakeholders um, in their work. Um, so what we support, um, first of all, we support uh, the uh, development and the adoption of uh, open science policies. Um, we support policy makers and institutions and funders in uh, um, developing and aligning their policies uh, with the, um, the European uh, uh, framework. And we have developed a number of um, uh, templates and, and fact sheets uh, to support you um, in, this, um, in this work. Um, we also um, provide interoperability services um, that connect research and enable researchers, uh, content providers, funders, and uh, um, research administrators to adopt open science. Um, we help you in uh, enriching your metadata and also um, we provide statistics uh, for um, repository um, um, access and at the same time um, uh, we help researchers to uh, funders I'm sorry um, to monitor the the outputs of the the research uh, they fund um, we also um, uh, support um, researchers with their research data in complying with the, the fair principles um, we have also developed services such as Amnesia um, to help you in anonymizing uh, sensitive uh, data and also the Argos tool um, to support um, automated processes um, to creating, managing and sharing um, data management plans. And obviously we also um, support you um, in, in providing open access to your publication through the development of uh, um, different guides by um, helping you to choose um, um, the um, a repository that better suits your um, needs. Um, how do we support you also in more practical ways? We have a, a help desk where you can uh, ask us um, uh, questions related to um, open access and open science um, issues, whether this has to do with uh, um, uh, compliance with the Horizon Framework or um, more specific issues such as uh, um, legal aspects such as the ones that we will be um, uh, discussing um, uh, today. Um, we have also developed um, FAQs where you can find answers in, in, in different uh, and over the years, we have also developed a variety of resources, such as, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, guides, uh, um, templates to facilitate um, institutions and funders in uh, um, adopting open science uh, policies, um, fact sheets uh, dealing with uh, um, issues such as, for example, copyright um, issues. And uh, also we provide, uh, we have developed an extensive uh, program of, of training, um, uh, physical meetings and, and workshops where you're all invited to, to participate. And uh, webinars focusing again on different uh, aspects, not just uh, um, uh, those that are related to uh, compliance with the uh, Horizon mandate, but also tackling uh, other aspects of uh, open science such as, for example, um, citizen science or uh, open innovation. 
um, a, a key um, element um, and um, a very important uh, aspect of open air is the, the network of the national open access desks, um, usually referred to as nodes. It's a pan-European network um, covering uh, 34 countries. And its creation um, lies in the fact that while research is global, support is local. Um, we have all come to realize that obviously there, um, um, this support needs to be um, tailored and uh, um, taken into consideration uh, the differences uh, between uh, countries and also um, the, the, the different levels of maturity in terms of the um, infrastructure that exists in each country. Um, um, whether they have already, um, they, they already have uh, policies or they might not have. Um, the level of awareness in terms of uh, open science and its different uh, aspects. Um, this means that there is no one-size-fits-all um, approach and therefore uh, this um, uh, network of uh, national open access desks is, is there um, to help all of you, whether you're a researcher, um, a policy maker or a content provider um, and, and guide you in, in locating uh, um, the different uh, resources and having the, the appropriate support. Um, as Gwen mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, uh, we have developed a number of different guides uh, that, um, and resources that are um, available on the, uh, on the Open Air portal. Uh, we encourage you to, to visit uh, um, our portal and, um, and, and browse through the, the different uh, materials and resources that are available. And as I mentioned before, um, they focus on, on different uh, aspects not just um, 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 how to comply with the horizon, for example, mandate, uh, but also with um, uh, uh, legal aspects, uh, uh, providing support in locating uh, trustworthy repositories uh, for your data or your uh, publications, um, uh, for example. Uh, finally, um, we organize a number of, uh, of webinars. Um, they're, um, um, they're free to join. Um, the recordings are, are also available on our, on our portal. So um, again, we encourage you um, to, to visit the Open Air website and, uh, and browse through um, the materials that we have uh, developed uh, over the years. Um, so I will now uh, present our, um, our three uh, speakers. Um, the first one is uh, Thomas Margoni, who is a senior lecturer in intellectual property and internet uh, law and co-director of CREATE at the School of Law at the University of Glasgow, where he also convenes the LLM program in intellectual property and digital economy. Um, Thomas' research focuses on the relationship between law and the new technologies, uh, with a particular attention to the role of the internet as the new medium to access, create, and disseminate knowledge in the information society. Our second speaker is Prodromos Tsiavos, who is the head of the digital development at the Honassis Cultural Center in Athens, and uh, he's also a senior research fellow at the Media Institute in London. Um, currently, Prodromos is advising Athena Research Center on legal and ethical aspects of data science and is teaching legal and ethical aspects of uh, data science at the Athens University of um, Economics and, and Business. Um, Prodromos, uh, Thomas and myself are also uh, um, um, uh, coordinating the policy and legal um, um, task force. And finally, um, Jacques Flores, who is our third uh, speaker, is an information and research data management specialist in the, um, at the um, um, Utrecht uh, University. Um, he comes from a neuroscience research background, and his role is to support researchers and students throughout the various stages of the research flow, from data collection to storage, management, and analysis, um, to data sharing and accessibility. 
Um, he's also a certified, uh, certified uh, information professional, which allows him to help researchers uh, who handle personal data as part of their research. Um, so I will now um, give the floor um, to Thomas. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, so I cannot share my screen yet. I need to be made. Uh, um, or you're still sharing your screen, Marina. I'm still sharing my screen. Um, I think that now I've stopped sharing my yeah. screen. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let me see if uh, this is the right one. Yeah, perfect. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to Marina and uh, Gwen for the nice uh, introduction, the kind words, and especially for their uh, effort to organize these two webinars on policy uh, and legal aspects, uh, which uh, have proved to be so far very popular. So another thank you to everyone who is uh, um, dedicating uh, us our their time to follow this uh, this discussion, which revolves around uh, topics that um, um, that are complicated and uh, that are um, for especially for researchers um, something that uh, it, it's not their main uh, focus. They do research how to deal with uh, the uh, data or results of their activity from a legal point of view is something that should be uh, as seamless as possible for them. So I think that uh, uh, today's webinar uh, is especially important because uh, um, the idea is that together, so through our presentation and through hopefully the, the new knowledge or the better understanding that you, uh, many of you as uh, as uh, a, a professional who work into in the um, research administration um, framework uh, we will all together be able to to make the life of researchers um, if not easier at least a bit more uh, understandable from a corporate point of view Today, my presentation will be very similar to the one I gave uh, um, in my, sorry, in my uh, previous webinar. I have mildly adjusted it to, in the light of some of the feedback, so I will try to be less technical if I can. Uh, I'll probably go a bit faster on some of the um, more technical topics and I collected uh, the questions uh, that uh, some of you sent in uh, before the webinar and I tried to offer some answers. So maybe uh, I'll try to focus more on these last two, two, three slides. And obviously if there are more questions, I'm very happy to take them on the live chat or uh, at the end uh, of the uh, three presentations. So my, my uh, focus today is on the uh, ownership side of data. And as such, uh, uh, the legal area that is mostly uh, affected by this, uh, this situation, it's that of copyright broadly understood. And the main question that you know, often causes a lot of uh, confusion is, what, is whether data is owned uh, and we all often hear about you know this is my data or well you know my pi said that the data i collected is his or you know um, want to move to a different uh, university or you know i got a job can i take my data uh, with me um so obviously these are very intricate questions but hopefully we'll try to make some clarity and i think that the main most important point here is to understand that uh, copyright as such says that data cannot be owned. Uh, ideas, procedures, methods of operation, mathematical concepts, etc., etc., are not protected by copyright. Uh, all national and international conventions are very clear on that. Only ex um, original expressions are protected. So the example is that uh, 
you know, if you want to write a tale about a doctor who goes uh, crazy and wants to create a monster made of pieces of uh, uh, other humans, and then the monster, you know, the monster turns out more crazy than the doctor, and then there is, a, I don't know, an ironic view on the role of, you know, humanity in modern times, then you can do that. What you cannot do is to copy the expressive, the, the original expression by um, Mary Shelley. So under this point of view, we can easily say that factual information and data as such, and the as such is very important, fail to qualify for copyright protection precisely for this reason. Now, that, this doesn't mean that there is no whatsoever legal protection for data. We can find other areas of law that offer, uh, to a certain degree, protection for data. But it's not a fully fledged, let's say, property right, so a very strong uh, right as it would have been in the case of copyright. Here we have trade secrets, uh, much more common in, in, in the private sector rather than in universities, but they exist uh, also in, in public research. Contracts, data protection, as we will see later today, PSI, etc., etc. The main message here is that these tools can offer some limited protection, but you cannot really talk about data ownership usually under these tools or not completely. What about databases? Because uh, uh, this, at least from a, a legal point of view, is a completely different categorization. Um, the law says that databases are protected by copyright if the selection or arrangement is original. But in this case, what is protected is the original element. So only the selection and arrangement, we could say the structure of the database, not the contained data. So, for example, if we had an original database composed of copyright protected elements, let's say journal articles, then we would have uh, um, a protected structure. And then the elements of this database would also be protected, but not because they are data from a legal point of view, but because they are work of authorship, they are journal articles. If the contents of this uh, database were, let's say, non-protected data, such as temperature measurements, then we would have a copyright in the database structure, which, however, does not extend to the content of the database. So these measurements could be easily reused by anyone because this data as such is not protected. Now, in Europe, th this is more or less, you know, with a good uh, degree of, uh, of, you know, with some approximation, but not too much, the situation worldwide. Um, in Europe, there is uh, a, a, an additional layer, a form of protection for non-original uh, databases, which extends to uh, data in certain cases. So in this situation, we still need a database, so a, a methodological organization of elements that are individually accessible. Uh, but we're not looking at the structure anymore. We're looking at whether there has been a substantial investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the data, not in creating the data. And that obviously opens a huge uh, door in terms of what data are created and which one are obtained. Um, in this case, the, the uh, substantial amount of the data, so not a single datum, but you know, a substantial amount, again, how to quantify it's another big question, is protected by the SGDR or SWI generous database right. Think of a lighter form of copyright. This means that we could have up to three different layers of uh, rights protecting um, a database. So the copyright in the structure, the copyright in the single elements if they are uh, protected by copyright, and this uh, SGDR uh, in the um, substantial investments that protect uh, de facto uh, a, a substantial amount of data. So this is very important because it also means that uh, um, if you are, if you want to reuse that database, you need to ensure that you have an authorization that covers all these three layers. And if you are the author of the database, then it means that you need to choose the right license, so a license that will cover all three layers. And in this case, a CC BY 4.0, it's a very good choice. There is another category of data, so those data that are not contained in the database, but in a work. 
So the example here that you know most applies to maybe natural language processing, machine learning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is whether you can extract statistical information, say about the English language, from a Harry Potter novel. So in theory, the answer would be yes, because this information is not protected as such. But in practice, because how especially EU law is uh, um, is framed, and I will avoid to enter into the details here. Uh, no, you need an authorization, and this authorization can take the form of a TDM exception, for example, so this is a statutory authorization, let's say, or a contractual authorization, let's say, a license. Um, so we are in a weird situation because, uh, you know, modern data analytics uh, uh, rely heavily on extracting these unprotected elements from protected works. So under this point of view, we can uh, reach the conclusion that even though there is no such a thing as ownership in data as such, we're in a situation where because of how copywriting works and the why generates database writing databases work, uh, very often you need some sort of authorization, either license or exception. Um, even though, as we say, data as such is not uh, in, owned or protected, which as you can imagine, it's the source of all your headaches when you receive this question and uh, you don't know how to answer. Uh, it's also useful to keep in mind that this extremely complicated situation is peculiar of the EU, uh, whereas abroad uh, uh, in the States, but also Canada, Singapore, Japan, uh, you name it, not, not every country, but a growing number of countries, uh, this has been uh, solved on a much more, um, you know, sometimes I say pro-innovation uh, way. Um, and obviously this leaves uh, the EU research and innovation sectors uh, uh, at a disadvantage if compared with these other countries. So is data owned and why does it matter for open science? I think that this is a very important aspect that should be made clear especially when you talk to uh, researchers who say, well, you know, I spent the last three years collecting this data. How can you say they are not mine? Um, so the goal of the law here, it's by excluding protection of ideas, principles, factor information, non-original expression, et cetera, et cetera, is to avoid the creation of, mo of monopolies over the information needed uh, by everyone to think, communicate, and create new knowledge. And, and this is very important for uh, not only for scientific freedoms, but you know, for, for us as a society in, in general. So for the you know, basic uh, fundamental rights to freedom of communication, freedom to impart and receive communication, freedom of scientific inquiry, et cetera, et cetera. And similarly, by excluding uh, in databases the created data element, the goal of the law is to avoid uh, a single source database is because this would create very anti-competitive situations. So the idea behind the theory of the law would be that on the one hand, these basic bricks of human knowledge, ideas and data as such, are not uh, owned because everyone should have access to, uh, to them in order to reuse them, verify them, replicate them, because you know it, it shouldn't be a peculiarity of uh, open science, uh, verifiability and replicability. It should be, you know, what determines whether something is scientific or not. If something is not very... Um, ...characteristic, it has to be reusable, then it's simply not scientific. And, you know, in many fields of... ...in terms of uh, replicability. On the other hand, the law recognizes uh, that uh, uh, there is an investment that people make in collecting this data, and they offer a limited reward uh, to compensate for this investment. And this limited reward is or should be if uh, the uh, copyright law followed copyright theory, uh, you know, would be framed around the distinction between uh, creating and obtaining data. So this is why it's so important and why it's matter for open science. Now here I brought an example that I will not discuss in detail, but is the text and data mining exception, uh, how it works in the UK and in Europe. So the reference to the CDPA is the Corporate Design Patent Act uh, 
uh, UK and the CDSM is the Corporate Individual Single Market Directive, the EU Directive. And you see how many limitations the tax and data mining exception uh, has to follow. So if we were in, say again, the States, the, uh, the only word in this uh, slide would be, can I tax and data mine? Yes. Mm -hmm. You see how different is the approach and you can imagine the implication for research and innovation. So here I have uh, um, some, uh, a list of the guides. We don't have to go through them, but I think they are very important. And I really would like to ask you to please uh, follow them, look at them, read them and uh, tell us, uh, you know, if they are useful, how useful they are, if there is anything that we do not cover, what do you need in addition? Because for us, it's, it's, uh, it's extremely important to know what, uh, what, you, what you do not know, because, you know, I know the, well, not all of the answer, but I know many of the answers. So, you know, for me, in order to create uh, a guide that covers something else, a, I need to know what you don't know. And, you know, the same is uh, true for, Prodromus, I'm sure. So please give us feedback, that's very important. Um, again, I have a couple of minutes left. So this is a list of uh, recent initiatives uh, connected to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, again, open access is probably, is not recent, but is the best uh, approach because it means that you do not have to ask for permission uh, on every single uh, uh, occasion. You have uh, a general public license, thus a general public permission. Um, and there are many initiatives that uh, you know, try to push for a similar approach, at least in connection with the current uh, uh, pandemic. Um, again, you have the links, you have the recording of the previous seminar if you want uh, a discussion that enters a bit more in the details of these initiatives. Um, and here, uh, I'll, I'll try to go through very quickly. Uh, I, on my watch, I have one minute and 30 seconds left. So sorry if I am uh, a bit fast, but uh, I think it makes sense to go through some of the questions we collected. How can I guarantee the use of data? The short answer is apply a CC0, because we said that data as such uh, are not protected. With a CC0, you make sure that uh, even if there is uh, some form of protection, let's say a uh, so generous database right, you waive those rights. Um, now, the long question, you, the, sorry, the long answer, you find it in the guides, and it depends a little bit on uh, uh, that uh, um, situation that I described in the case of databases where we have up to three different layers. So, you know, the, the the short answer is CC0 is probably the best license for data because it's not a license, it's just a, a waiver of any eventual right that could exist. Um, otherwise, please uh, uh, consult the guides. Um, the Open Data Directive and the EIPR may conflict. Um, they, they may, but it really depends on a number of factors. Um, in the simplest scenario, open data requires reusability, but accessibility is a matter of uh, national law. Um, also, the uh, PSO, the Open Data Directive, uh, uh, makes save uh, IP rights uh, that belong to third parties. So that's another, uh, you know, um, area of, of exemption. Uh, again, it also depends how this reusability is framed under national uh, uh, guidelines, laws, or regulation. Because if there is uh, a right, then that right probably it's uh, licensed following either a CC license or an open government license. And in that case, the um, the um, the third party who would like to reuse that data has to follow the license. Um, again, it depends what kind of rights uh, exist in that data. So this brings us back to the first question. I won't enter into the details, but you know, it, it, there is a situation where there is a license that is applied to data which are not protected and what is the value of that license. If you want to know the answer, please uh, you know, ask me. If you don't know what I'm saying, please discard completely this issue because it's uh, interesting, maybe more from you know, the academic point of view. Um, how, under, how and under which umbrella can data legally be protected? So hopefully this is clearer now. 
that as such is not protected by copyright or, or the sui generis database right data structured in a database may be protected by the sgdr if there is substantial investment in obtaining verifying or presenting but not creating trade secrets may protect data as such so there's no need for a database but only under certain conditions contracts may do that as well but only between parties to that contract uh, how can information be retrieved without being considered a plagiarism? Well, the you know, general answer is ideas and facts are not protected, so you can reuse them. Original expressions are, so do not copy original expressions. This is the answer from the legal point of view. But the law doesn't cover all aspects of our lives, so there are also norms that apply in a certain community. So in the scientific community, even if you copy the uh, say, I don't know, a noble uh, idea by a colleague uh, without really uh, infringing on his copyright, the scientific norm, which comes with some sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 social uh, remedies, is to acknowledge that uh, um, idea. So uh, you are discussing a new idea that you heard at a conference and you say, well, you know, thank you to Professor X and Y for inspiring me this idea. Is it legal to summarize my thesis an article that may be published in the International Journal? Well, if it is your thesis, so the copy belongs to you and you did not transfer to anyone and there is no, let's say, you know, it's, it's, it's already been public, you defended it, then you can do in principle whatever you want from a corporate point of view. Um, uh, I'm interested in how to make researchers understand that it is important to protect results before publishing results. Many of them are extremely focused on in publishing the results uh, and eventually have some problem when trying to protect them via patent, for example. So in the case of patents, yes, you have uh, to, you know, if you disclose your potentially patentable invention before you file for a patent, then you're the strong novelty. So you could preclude yourself uh, that path. But that applies only to patents and usually, hopefully, universities have uh, technological transfer offices that uh, are dedicated to advise uh, people, uh, scientists uh, in, in this area. Um, it's also true that uh, this applies mostly to patents because patents need to be registered, whereas copyright and the uh, generis database right uh, operate automatically, so you don't need to register copyright by the, you know, the expression is the sole fact of creation, you are protected by copyright. So in the case of copyright, this form of protection is more automatic. Um, and then it depends a lot on the strategy of universities. More and more universities are realizing that only certain patents can be uh, properly exploited commercially, but a lot of the information and the knowledge that university generate should not be prepared, you know, exploited through the standard patent uh, route so you know this is perhaps more of a university strategy issue um that applies specifically to the patent field uh this i think is the last question i hope i didn't rush too much through them uh, and thank you very much um thank you thomas um just before uh, proceeding to our second speaker just to remind everyone that if you have uh, um, questions for the presenters, you can use the Q&A window and for um, all other questions that are or, or more uh, general uh, nature, more technical or related to um, the, the infrastructure, please use uh, the, the chat window. Um, so, Prodromos, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Just give me a second to share the screen. Yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so um, it's great uh, to be again here. And um, as uh, similarly to Thomas, I have adjusted the presentation on the basis of the feedback we have received after last week's presentation. And so there, I hope there, it's going to be a less technical, although it's inevitable to make reference to certain legal provisions. Um, um, so um, again, I would like to. Uh, uh, Ramos, sorry, I'm interrupting you. You have in your your vision is in presenting mode, in presenter mode instead of. Um, like, oh, right. For some reason, yeah. one second. Let me just try. Let's just stop sharing. Perhaps I'll try 
because I have to monitor perhaps for some reason that is the case. Let me try again. Let me know. Um, oops, sorry. For some reason it doesn't work. Give me a second. All right. Um, Try again. No. All right. So trying to give at the beginning uh, the outset of the uh, GDPR, which I think is uh, is quite essential to understand uh, why it is important to actually both adhere to GDPR, but also see it as basically a set of instructions rather than an impediment. Uh, some key items about how do we uh, go about when we have a data set which contains personal data, a bit of the setting in relation to what uh, constitutes scientific research, um, and also defining the scientific research in the context of GDPR, a few things about the purpose processing, the legal basis, and the data subject rights, and then I, I tried similarly to Thomas to collect questions we have received over the past um, couple of days and, and, and try to address them within the context of our presentation. So the first point, which is um, for me quite important, is to appreciate that the general data protection regulation is mostly uh, a piece of regulation which is about uh, indicating how we are to share our data. Um, it is not just about protecting natural persons from the processing of personal data, but also about the free movement of such data. And this is a very important thing because when we actually have any data sets, we need to be able to actually identify um, the different range of data that we have to deal with. What is the kind of processing we would like to do? Very, very important. What is the purpose of the uh, processing? And scientific research is a very broad purpose and we need to be more specific about it because that directly links to the legal basis. And here we need to be particularly careful with the, um, uh, with the case of sensitive personal data, uh, the special categories of personal data, precisely because they require extra um, uh, pro um, protection and extra care from our side. And this is translated in very specific steps and of course, making sure that whatever we do in terms of the processing and the purpose we have, it is covered by the legal basis. And I'll return to this one uh, later. Um, the setting with which we work is normally within a research performing organization. And this practically means we need to adhere to two sets of rules. The first thing is the um, general data protection regulation as it is. Um, it has been exercised within our jurisdiction and that is quite important in relation to um, the, uh, particularly the rights of the data subject. And I'll return to this point later. And secondly, uh, in relation to the ethics framework that uh, we have in our research performing organization. The reason why this is so important is that it's very frequent that the ethics framework provides additional obligations. Uh, we will say it in quite a few times, but it could be that we could use as a legal basis the uh, public task, but we end up with consent precisely because we need to do so uh, due to the ethics framework we have in our institution. The second thing is the uh, EU or other collaborative projects. And, and this is a, a classic question. What happens when I have a, a collaborative project, let's say a consortium responding to an EU call and uh, there are some personal data involved. And here, uh, there is, of course, no answer um, that actually covers all cases, but we would generally suggest that we actually check the web packages and see um, where exactly the data process, the data, personal data are processed. Are they processed by a single partner, by multiple partners? And the CA and the work packages, the consortium agreement and the work packages we, would actually let us know about that, uh, would, would tell us about that. And uh, at the same time, it is important to understand why we are processing this data. So for instance, in almost all European projects, we will have a dissemination package. It will certainly have different databases in relation to um, uh, people or institutions we would like to contact. Uh, when we have this list of people, which are natural persons, we have to make sure we do that in accordance with the general data protection regulation. And here, 
the legal basis is not going to be the scientific research. Here, the, the, the legal basis would most probably be legal interest or concern or some other um, um, uh, justification we have as to how the data have been obtained. If the data have been obtained by multiple sources, we have to make sure there is a legal basis both for how they have been collected and how they have reached us. The second area where we saw, see a lot of personal data processing is the actual data. And here, the purpose is clearly scientific, but we have to see how they have been collected, for instance, directly from the data subject or from a third source, and why are we doing that? In that case, we have to see how we are compliant with ethics and data protection requirements, which again, they have to, at the point of processing, in the work packets where the data are being processed. Um, again, we may have collaborative projects which happen within a single jurisdiction or in multiple jurisdiction, or as we will see at the end, uh, in relation to other institutions and entities in third countries, that is non-EU countries. In those cases, we need to make sure that these institutions have an adequate framework of data protection as we do. Um, that is mostly going to be expressed in the contracts or between these um, third parties and us, uh, either uh, when we work um, uh, as, a, um, as a processor or as a controller or as co-processor or as co-controllers. Um, <coughs> in most of the cases, we are going to be operating as co-controllers and we need to make sure all, uh, uh, all necessary uh, measures are in place and they have to be expressed in a contractual agreement. There has been a question as to whether there is model such agreements. Uh, indeed there are, and we are going to speak about them at the end, but we would always suggest that you get advice from your legal department as to how you form them, because the, each case is very different. Also, the call may have conditions in relation to developing an ethics report, a protection impact assessment, or other additional requirements that stem from the call itself for the project. When we have a tender, and it's not a simple call, uh, the tender with the commission, for instance, or a public authority, or a private entity, which actually asks you to perform some kind of research, then the legal, uh, then the legal basis is most probably going to be uh, the contract itself. And in all cases, or in most cases, you're going to be operating as a processor or co-controller, but not as a controller. In all these cases, it is important to identify who the data protection officer is and how the data protection officer of your institution interacts with other data protection officers in a consortium or in a tender, uh, in any kind of agreement you have with any kind of uh, contracting authority. Now, in terms of the definitions of scientific research, we find it in multiple places within the uh, general data protection regulations. Uh, most important are, is Article 89, where we have a definition and operation of the um, uh, scientific research, but we also find it in several recitals, as well as in the definition of processing, uh, but also in the limitations and exceptions, uh, actually to the exceptions uh, or in relation to the data subject rights. So this is quite important to see uh, where it is irrelevant, scientific re research is relevant as a legal basis or to tell us things about the legal basis or it is very relevant in order to understand um, the range of processing we can do or finally uh, how the uh, rights of the data subject may be exercised. Um, scientific research, uh, what we see in Europe in particular is that uh, this is something which is mostly falls under the broader public interest legal basis. That's, so this is not the only possible legal basis. Uh, as I mentioned before, very frequently we would have uh, the case where we have uh, consent as a reason why we are processing personal data and there could be other legal basis as well, but mostly these are the most uh, frequently um, found ones. Um, another thing is that very, it's another very frequent thing is that the um, um, processing for scientific purposes constitutes itself further processing or it could lead to further processing. Let me give you two examples. First case, I obtained data from a public source, public hospital, um, and uh, then I process them for scientific reasons or I um, obtained the data from uh, social media. Um, in both cases, they have been collected by a third party initially for purpose one. And then when I um, engage into scientific research, I change the purpose and therefore even the legal basis. And we'll talk more about it later. 
what is essential is in all these cases that the appropriate safeguards are there. So it is the, um, it remains a fact that um, the general data protection regulation provides you with a pretty good basis for processing personal data, but you still have to put appropriate safeguards in place. And this would normally be two, of two kinds, data minimization, which means you only use the data you need. For instance, if you are processing um, a child's personal data because you're doing research with the, which involves children, it's not necessary that you put the name, even if it could be that you keep their uh, image or you don't necessarily, you don't get their address unless you need it for other reasons, for instance, for contacting their parents. Um, in all cases, also, it is wrongly suggested that the data are pseudonymized, at least, uh, if not anonymized. And uh, in the, this is a, a necessary, um, 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 let's say, condition for processing them, unless, as we'll see later, this interferes with the research itself. Now, when we have special categories of data, which means what we used to call sensitive data, you will see that we have a repetition of some of the key um, principles of personal data protection, uh, especially proportionality, uh, respect of the rights of the data protection, and also providing, again, uh, suitable and specific measures to, um, to safeguard fundamental rights. And these suitable measures, again, they would pretty much have to do uh, on the one hand with minimization and pseudonymization, but also with how the um, data subject is able to exercise her rights. So it's very important if, for instance, I process, let's say, sensitive health data, I have to make sure that uh, all necessarily notices are there. I have to make sure that if the data subject wants to object, they have the possibility to do so. And I have to make sure that I have in place organizational and technical measures to prevent any kind of leakage of the relevant data. Now, in terms of the purpose itself, we have, um, um, as we said, um, the overall purpose is always scientific, but specific types of research may require uh, specific types of legal justification and legal basis. And in that sense, uh, we need to see how we link those two. So um, it could be um, that I do a secondary use uh, while the original collection has been done uh, by a hospital or by a public authority for statistical reasons. Uh, even if, when I stay within the same legal basis in name, for instance, public task, I have to explain how this public task is retained. And I'll return to this question when we talk more about the um, uh, further processing of data. Um, and we mentioned quite a few, um, some of the uh, legal basis, uh, public interest, uh, contracts, consent, and how this changed. So let me uh, go and give you an example. Uh, and here again, you can see the legal basis. Um, if, if we have, uh, if in order to understand how uh, this uh, legal basis remains, we have to trace the data. We have to follow the data. Using the data management plan as our backbone is a very important yardstick for what we want to do. And we can see how different types of data processing, um, they may serve different purposes and have different legal basis, but we always have to stay within the legal basis. So for instance, I get the example, which I mentioned before, the data collection is taking place because of public interest reasons by a public authority. So this is the data collection stage and this is processing, but we have a researcher who's actually taking these data and updates them, enriches them, improves them in order to perform her research, which is again public interest, but is a different public interest from the original one. So this is a case of further processing. And it could be that this needs to be preserved for let's say five years after research has taken place for reasons of auditing, which is a legal obligation or it could be a contractual obligation. And then when the data are to be released, because let's say they it wasn't possible and, or it wasn't um, uh, relevant for the research to be anonymized or fully, uh, fully anonymized or pseudonymized, uh, then what the researcher does, it obtains a consent. So in all cases, you may have the same data set or slightly different, which changes uh, places as it is being processed. You see there is always a legal basis. Now, uh, um, we will see uh, how this works at the end in, in the question section. Um, but uh, before going there, I, I just would like to, to finish the, the main presentation by actually saying that um, the uh, processing of personal data for scientific purposes is also entailing a severe limiting of data subject, subject rights. 
which is, however, accompanied by a series of, again, of measures that try to mitigate uh, the damage that the, um, person, uh, the person whose data are being processed, the data subject, uh, is actually occurring. Um, so, more specifically, um, there are limitations in terms of the data subject rights to be informed, but this has to be, um, uh, the, can be done, but the, then the provision of the sets is either, in, uh, the provision of the information is either impossible or would involve a disproportionate effort, which means, for instance, if I have collected data uh, from a public source and uh, in order to contact all individuals of my data sets, uh, this would render it impossible because of cost and time, uh, then it is very likely that I don't have to actually uh, provide such information. Uh, and in all cases, I would make sure that this doesn't kill my research and I should be sure that whatever I do, I try to protect the data subject's interest as much as possible. Secondly, um, the, uh, the right to be forgotten can be also limited for the obvious reason that it could be that uh, such right actually stops research. Uh, it could be that I need to have, for instance, in the context of historical research, I may need to retain certain pictures. Uh, if someone has uh, or exercises the right to be forgotten and is kills the research, then um, I have the right to object to it. And finally, if the data subject wants us to stop the uh, processing of data because of objection, I can, um, I can um, uh, reject that uh, as a researcher for reasons of uh, public interest. Uh, another important thing is always look at your national laws because there may be national derogations in four types of rights, right of access, rectification, restriction of processing, and right to object. So national laws may provide variations in relation to how the data subject may exercise such rights. Now, moving to the questions we, we have received, I, we have, I have collected some of them here in questions, and let's try to see each one of them separately. Um, the first question is, what if I reuse data which I have, I have harvested from publicly available resources, uh, sources, um, or uh, in general, um, uh, data which have been obtained from different sources? In all cases, I have to check what was the original purpose of the processing. So why were these data obtained in the first place? So if this is, for instance, data found on, on Facebook or social media, they would have as their uh, legal basis a contractual relationship or consent, depending on the situation. And then I have to check what am I going to do with uh, my process in this federacy. And in order to do, um, in, actually, in order to actually be engaged in, in trade processing, I will have to uh, notify the data subject for a range of things from the identity of the controller and the, my data protection officer to the purposes of processing the categories of virtual data used, who else is going to get the data, if there is someone outside Europe that is going to get the data and where it came from. Now, apparently in, in these cases of further processing, I have to see um, how, to what extent this is something which is uh, feasible. And again, I have to see what is, again, the legal basis under which I am processing the data. Um, as we said before, it, it always has to be, uh, there always has to be a legal basis. So this legal basis either is the same or it is consent or I have to somehow identify a new legal basis. And uh, when I have, uh, when I want to further proceed without obtaining a fresh uh, consent from the data subject, um, then I have to check how, what is the relationship between the previous legal basis and my new legal basis. So if the hospital has obtained the data in order to contain an epidemic, is my new process incompatible to this uh, in original process? Or if it has been obtained as a result of a contract, is my research compatible? And the, the, um, the General Data Protection Directive uh, regulation gives us uh, five very specific uh, conditions to check that to see what is the link between original and further processing, what is the context, if there are special categories, what external measures have I taken, and what are the safeguards which I'm using for processing my data. Uh, in all cases, the information of the data subject has to be given, and I should always try to um, pseudonymize, pseudonymize this data. If the data are transferred to a third country, um, there is a whole, again, range of uh, conditions for doing so. Very important, what is the contractual relationship between us and the third, um, and the entity in the third country? And that's why before I mentioned 
the contract and the um, um, also the uh, um, um, the the possible consortium agreements. Uh, also, the um, if there is a standard contractual clause, and here again we have some conditions, some standard contractual clauses by the EU, which I, I would also suggest for those that want to see one uh, to actually check um, um, the SEC uh, clauses. Uh, what happens if the initial collection is for legitimate interest and secondary research use? Um, here, uh, what is important is to have a very solid notification process to the data subject and a very solid objection process so that it is possible for the data subject to get out of the processing if she wishes to do so. Uh, whenever we have further processing, uh, the obligations of accuracy and minimization clearly decrease. So it means we have to make sure that we follow all the conditions mentioned before, but we also have to make sure we minimize data as much as possible. Uh, health data and GDPR, Jack is going to talk more about this one. Uh, a lot, always bear in mind these are special categories of data and we have to see how we actually um, process that data in order to make sure that the purposes is proportional uh, to the legal basis we use. Data sharing codes of contact, um, I suggest to uh, check the ICO in the UK. I think this is a very good uh, document to see different uh, data sharing uh, codes of practices and of course the relevant OECD uh, webpage which has the um, ethics codes of conduct list. Um, someone has asked if there is a personal data for small projects other than Excel. I would say if it's a small research project, Excel rules unfortunately. Uh, but how you fill in and how you construct such Excel uh, document is quite important. Um, and I would make some very simple suggestion, suggestions, specify your research purpose and define data range. Make sure you specify and document your legal basis. If you have consent, make sure you manage it properly. So it means that you provide all necessary information, you store the consent and make sure it covers all the types of processing and your purposes. As I said before, use data management plan as your backbone and always consult with your ethics committee and data protection officer. So I, I try to, to cover most of the uh, questions uh, in 20 minutes. Um, I don't know whether we, uh, we are going to address questions now or later. Let's, um, uh, Padre Romas, there are quite some questions for you in the Q&A. Let's address them after Jacques' talk, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. You should all now be able to see my screen. Is that correct? Yes. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jack Flores. Uh, sorry to introduce a little bit. But what I want to talk about is an extension of what uh, Prodromos just talked about, right? So I'm still going to be going over the GDPR, but a little bit more on how it applies in research setting, um, given my experience also within, um, within research. So I will go over the legal basis once again, um, just from our perspective, uh, we see it similar. So, so there's quite a few ways in which you can lawfully process personal data. Now we have informed consent and legitimate interest of the controller. Now, normally at our university, we use informed consent as our legal basis. And this is because it also meets the ethical obligations that we have towards the participants. So as you know, even if you use, let's say, public interest as your legal basis, oftentimes you will also require an informed consent because it's also an ethical demand. And as such, this is the, um, the road that we take. Now, sometimes we've actually used legitimate interest of the controller. Now, this is a particularly difficult legal basis to define sometimes but it can be used in certain circumstances. But if you are to use this, you must know very well why you think you're allowed to use this. And in our case, when we do recommend this, uh, sometimes for social media or similar studies, we do demand a data protection impact assessment, which is a very detailed uh, look into whether you can actually process this data and what the risks are to the data subjects. Now, public interest is something that we've considered as using as, as our legal basis by default we're still not entirely certain when something is actually to the public interest entirely. Now, we know that we are a public institution, but does this denote that we are actually, everything, every research that goes on is for the public interest and is necessary for the public interest. 
Now we know for certain cases, for example, COVID-19, the uh, European Data Protection Board has already made it certain that if you are doing research and you want to share uh, data concerning this, this is actually in the public interest. Now the fact that they make a, a statement for the COVID-19 um, still, still makes us consider maybe in the future we can use this legal basis more freely and not be afraid that perhaps it does not apply to every single research instance. Now, when we are talking about informed consent, there's some things that should also always be there now. So for researchers, since we use this as our main legal basis and as well as our ethical one, we try to make sure that they're making these the right way. Now, of course, they're freely given, specific and informed. And usually in the informed part is where sometimes we see some things give out. Now, at the end of this presentation, my aim is to give some input on how to make informed consent more suitable for sharing data. Now, an important part of information, and Prodromos already showed this, is some of the information that should be there. So I'm not gonna go over this since it's already been um, presented, but these are things that definitely should be in every single informed consent. And more restrictions apply if you have, um, say you're transferring the data to another country. We also looked at purpose limitations. So Prodromos talked about this and further processing. Now this is quite important for research. So I really wanted to expand on this and show you guys how we uh, use this, how we look into this to make sure that certain research can go ahead uh, more easily. So the GDPR distinguishes between two types of data use. We have the, uh, let's say the initial data collection use, which is when you use data directly collected for a particular uh, purpose, a scientific study in this case. And then you have the secondary use, which is when you're reusing data. So if you've collected already the health data for a particular purpose, but then you want to repurpose this, so reuse this for another purpose, which is research in this case. Now, when that secondary use is research, it is actually allowed to do so in the GDPR. Now I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but basically so long as you're reusing this and this particular purpose is research, then you can go ahead and do this without let's say requiring extra consent from the individuals. So long as you apply the proper technical and organizational measures to make sure that you are protecting your data subjects. Now, what does this mean? What are technical and organizational measures? Well, to put it um, simply, it's these things, for example. So there are more that can apply, but most of the time we say, you know, if it's really sensitive data, we recommend encryption. Now, this is really something that we recommend when it's really sensitive data, because encryption can lead to issues uh, when you forget the password, and trust me, it does happen. Then we have pseudonymization, anonymization, um, minimization, aggregation, abstraction, and of course, restricted access. Now, anonymization is actually very difficult to achieve uh, if you follow the, uh, the definition of the GDPR. So in most cases, we really go towards saying, uh, towards the researchers and say, make sure that you're pseudonymizing the data and make sure that you're promising or speaking of your data as being pseudonymized. And only if you're absolutely certain, say that it is anonymized. Because if it is anonymized, then the individuals can no longer be re-identified. And in which case the GDPR does not apply at all. And it's, that's a leap that you only want to make sure when you're entirely certain, because if you're wrong, well, then a lot of things are going to happen and not in your benefit. But to exemplify this a little bit more, this idea of further processing, does that mean basically if something was collected for research, let's say epidemiological research, and we want to reuse this data for epidemiological research, does the GDPR say that this is okay? Well, yes, it does, so long as you have the proper safeguards in place. But let's say we want to use it for a different sort of research. So we gather it for epidemiological research, we want to use it for cancer immunology, but it's still both the research. GDPR still says, okay, as long as you have the, the safeguards in place. But we move further along and we can see that something is collected, for example, in hormone research. And then you want to reuse this, but not for hormone research, but for gender studies. And it's still uh, research in gender studies. The GDPR would actually still say this is okay because it's not, it does not distinguish between types of research. It simply says, so long as the second purpose is for research purposes, then this is allowed as long as proper safeguards are in place. Now this poses a problem for us in that we have to also look at the ethical aspects of it. So just because it would be legal, it doesn't necessarily mean it is ethical. And why I make this example is because you could see why some individuals, although they lend themselves or their data, their personal data for, uh, for hormone research, they might have some issues with gender studies for whatever personal reasons they may have. And in which case 
there might be some um, reasons as to why we shouldn't be processing this data, not from a legal standpoint, but from the ethical standpoint. And how these two meet is sometimes uh, difficult to see. Now, we talked about further processing. You can process it. You don't need to re ask for consent per se. But what still applies, and this is one of the rights that Prodromos introduced, is the right to information, which means that you still need to make an effort, show that you uh, show to your data subjects that something else is happening to the data. Now, you don't need their consent for it, but they need to be informed. Unless, of course, and this is a derogation that may apply to research in some cases, is when it involves a disproportionate effort to comply to it. What does this mean? What is a disproportionate effort? Well, the way we see it is, imagine if your data set has no contact information, but the data has been heavily pseudonymized. And we think that this data, for example, poses a low risk to the individual. So we're not talking about something that if it were made public, it could cause harm to these individuals. And there is no central forum or platform where these individuals may be or have access to in which you could make this information available. In this case, we would offer saying, perhaps here, this proportion that uh, applies and you do not need to inform all of these individuals. Now, well, onto the heart of it, what I want to say is when you do want to share personal data, it is possible, but you do have to think of it ahead of time. Oftentimes, researchers come to us and they have a funder mandate that says they should share uh, data. But of course, it's personal data. And they say, can we share it? Uh, what do we need to share it? Well, I usually say, let's look at the informed consent, because that's what we use as a legal basis, of course. And of course, it's also the ethical uh, aspect of it. And see how you formulated it, because if you've made promises that you cannot keep up, or you haven't set up your data in such a way, then it's actually no longer possible for you to share your personal data at all. Now, one of the first do's of sharing data and your informed consent is to, well, actually tell them that you intend to share in this data. Transparency is key in the GDPR, right? So if you make it clear to them that this is one of the aims, you're already uh, ahead of the curve. And just let them know that, you know, other researchers may request access for this data in the future and make sure that they're okay with this but also be transparent about the information that you will make available. Oftentimes I see that uh, researchers just say, is it okay if we make your data available? Sure, this is nice, but you want to let them know exactly which of uh, the personal data that you've collected from them, in the case there is vari various variables, you're actually going to make, make available, which ones are actually necessary. Sometimes it is all of them, sometimes it doesn't need to be. Moreover, also let them know that you're going to protect this data in some way, so that you're going to pseudonymize it, that you're going to aggregate it. Now, here, here comes an issue that I want to raise up, which is how much information can you possibly fit in these things? And that's true. Um, you don't want your informed consent to become a Bible. You still wanna have some balance because it also makes it easier to understand for your data subject. Now, a lot of this information can be layered within informed consents, which makes it easier to uh, send this information towards your participants, but do be granular about which personal data you're collecting from them and which you plan to make available and on, or with which privacy measures in place. Perhaps a little bit more important and something that I find quite often is what you shouldn't put in informed consent if you plan or you want to share the data. Now, one of them, as I mentioned this already, is avoid terms such as fully anonymous because it is very difficult to achieve. And to be truly anonymous, it doesn't even matter whether you can no longer identify these individuals within your own data set, but nobody else, no other organization should be able to um, identify, them, identify these individuals. So then you can always be certain of this. And for this reasons, we always just recommend, just mention that it is pseudonymous and not anonymous also avoid promises to destroy all the data after they've finished with it. If you've destroyed the data, you cannot possibly share it. It's as simple as that. Now, sometimes you may have an interview in audio and then transcribe this into text and you will delete the audio. This is fine, but make sure that you state this and you just simply don't say all the data will be destroyed, but be granular about which data will be destroyed. Also avoid promises that the data will only be accessed by the research team um, for obvious reasons. Uh, obviously, if you're sharing the data, it will not only be accessed by the research team. If you've already made this promise, it sounds nice, but it's actually not what you plan to do. Now, when you do share data, it's important to share the metadata and place the data under restricted access. Now, this not only 
doesn't always need to be the case, but it, it does help you protect this, uh, this data a lot more. Now this can sometimes be troublesome. So for how long are you going to keep this data and who is actually going to take care of this? And I think I have a question later on that I will address that uh, covers this. And it's always good that if you are transferring this data, that there is a data transfer agreement in place. This makes sure that there are legal requirements that must be met by the other party requesting this data. Now, overall, the GDPR really just asks researchers to be transparent towards their participants as to how their data will be handled and for what purpose. And research does hold a privileged spot. There are derogations in place that soften some of the restrictions so long as it is for research and so long as there are proper um, measures uh, that are being adopted by their researchers. So most of all, it comes to understanding what you need. And the things that we mentioned today is, for example, understanding what is your legal basis, which one are you using? And also, at which point of the data flow does this switch, perhaps? And I think Prodromos explained this quite nicely, is sometimes you have different legal basis for different aspects of the research. And simply understanding this will go a long way. What's nice is that you can reuse this a lot of the times when you have similar research. Now, I wanted to address some of the questions that were put in, um, that were raised. So the first one was about what is the best way to deal with international research consortia? And can you talk about the personal data and how it will be governed within these agreements? Or do you need uh, something else? Now, it's actually very important to put this in, um, in the consortium agreements. The problem is that a lot of the templates and the default consortium agreements do not cover personal data at all. So by the time that they're done, there's just nothing in place. Now, it doesn't need to be in the consortium agreement. It just needs to be somewhere. But definitely, when you're working with other institutions, how this data has been handled needs to be sorted out. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be standard contractual clauses. Um, it can be simply documentation saying how it is it that you're actually going to, who is the controllers, how is data going to be transferred between one uh, institution and the other? Is there going to be a data transfer agreement in place? Or is uh, the legal basis, if you're using consent, does this already denote that there's going to be many controllers? Again, think of these ahead of time. It's going to go a long way in facilitating the way that data can be exchanged in this consortium. And the consortium agreement is a great place to put them, but they do need to be adapted uh, for this particular case. Now, another question was, does the GDPR apply for European Union only, or does it cover other countries? Now, this is what is called the territorial scope. Now, what needs to be understood is basically if you're a European institution, it doesn't matter which, whose personal data you're collecting, the GDPR will apply to you. So for example, if I collect data from Peru, from Peruvian citizens, and I am a European institution, so I'm from Utrecht University, the GDPR will apply, even though all of this data may belong to non-European citizens. And I think in that case, if you're a European institution, it will always apply. When are patient data sufficiently identified to be able to share data sets publicly online? What should be in place? What to take into account? This depends so much on the actual uh, patient data set, right? So what variables do you have? And also depends on the, the legal basis and the promises that you've made to your patients. So it's, it's a question that is um, difficult to answer, but I can say what to take into account. Well, take into account the legal basis that you've had and take, take into account the risks that may be posed to your patient data, to, sorry, to your data, to data subjects, if this information uh, is made public as you wish. What do you think of the privacy conditions of online meeting applications such as Zoom? Uh, they're not the greatest. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's definitely not, it's, the privacy is low, but what you actually store in there, you have to be very careful when using them. How to manage publish but control access data sets for the long term? Should participants be receiving updates about how the data are being used and who will be determining whether a third party gets access? Yes, so this is the question that I mentioned earlier. And this is something that we deal quite a lot. And it's difficult. Um, we do say not to hand this responsibility to the PhDs, although they sometimes are often the ones who know the most about that particular data set. But because they leave and the um, the university should have is at the end, the ones that are responsible for this data, they are the controllers. Now, this is not an easy question to answer since PIs may also move and we've also had this occur. And we've run into problems where somebody has requested access for data sets and we had to find someone outside of the university to give access, even though were, we were the controllers, which 
should actually not be the case. If we're the controllers, we should have control over these things. So I don't have a perfect answer, but as long as you can keep that responsible person within the institution from where this data is uh, being stored with the controller is, that's the best way forward. But we're still moving forward trying to figure out what is the best way to handle this. I must be uh, honest. Ideally, when sharing data that falls under the GDPR purview, we want to have third parties sign a data sharing agreement. Can we set up standard models for such an agreement? Now, so we, we use data transfer agreements um, and there are standard models, so to speak, we have one for the university, but we're very careful in handing these out. I've had it where people have sent me the standard model that they had for an agreement and just simply because of the way and the nature of the, the processing that they were hoping, uh, well, basically they, they had a certain um, idea of what should happen to this data and they used a standard model. Now the standard model had a clause within it that actually prevented them from doing exactly what they wanted to do, which is they wanted to use information and link it with another set, which is fine, but because they did not understand and simply thought that a standard model would cover everything, they were about to restrict themselves from actually being able to use this data the way they wanted to. So basically the answer to this is that it's oftentimes very case dependent and you sh it's good to use some standard models for data transfer agreements, but you should definitely have a look at them and make sure that they are adapted to your particular purpose. Now, the, the last question, for data that doesn't meet the standards of what is anonymous, but would be quite difficult to identify, is there an option to control access solely by requiring the user to, the re, uh, reuser to digitally sign a list of terms and conditions? Um, so this is somewhat similar to having something that is standard that can just be uh, signed off um, automatically. I, don't think this is something that could be done. It's just too easy to just say yes and then the data gets uh, sent off. And as a, as a controller of the data, that means that you're not really controlling who's accessing this data, but they just have to say yes thing or the other. And you haven't made sure that these people um, will actually hold up, hold up their end of the deal. So I think that doesn't provide enough protection to the data that you're working with. Um, maybe in certain situations it would apply, but that, that would fall outside of my, uh, my understanding. That's uh, all the questions that I wanted to um, answer at the moment. I know there must be more, so I'll, I'll give the floor away to, to the questions and answers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jacques, for this uh, very useful uh, addition or this final part of the webinar. I'm just going to... Um, show you the link to the satisfaction survey because before we go on with the, with the Q&A because there are quite some Q&As left in the in the chat window um, I just have a, a couple of uh, other pra very practical announcements and the first one is that uh, uh, so I will paste the link to the satisfaction survey in the chat the second one is that we got a couple of requests from people I forgot to say this in my introduction actually uh, who were asking about local versions of this webinar in local languages, so not, not in English. And I just wanted to let you know that we're looking into that with the, with the Open Air NOAADS. There already, have, there already have been organized some webinars, if you look at our page, and on the subject in, in other languages. So please take a look there, and uh, we'll try to keep you in the loop, if anything, um, if we manage to organize other ones. And finally, um, just picking up on a question that was asked by a couple of people, and Jack mentioned it as well, about the use of Zoom for a webinar infrastructure. Um, we do have, uh, unfortunately, only limited options um, for using webinars of this, for hosting webinars of this size. But uh, we can guarantee you that we will not be, um, so as you don't, you're not registering to the system, so uh, we will not, we're not sharing your emails with the system. And also we are not recording the chat so um, we try to be as, as privacy friendly as possible in a not very privacy friendly uh, infrastructure. I just want to mention that. And now I will give the floor to uh, Marina who will uh, coordinate the answer, question and answers that are still, uh, that are still in the list. Okay, so thank you, uh, Gwen. Uh, as you mentioned, there's still uh, uh, a number of questions that are still open. 
Um, so the first one, um, how does the right to be forgotten work in practice for published research data? Uh, if a subject wants to be forgotten, once the data is published, what are the researcher's obligations? Uh, do you want to say something on this one or? Yes, yeah. yes, please. Yeah, um, there are two things. One thing is always to remember that the, um, the right to be forgotten uh, in relation to scientific research may be limited uh, to the extent um, that such right actually um, prohibits the research itself. Um, so we already have a first boundary as to how it can be exercised, which means practically if you have um, someone uh, posing this question, uh, it is uh, again uh, an issue of how you justify a possible denial. <coughs> Having said that, if you decide to erase the data nevertheless, um, what should you should be doing is basically make sure, first of all, that you stop disseminating from now on. And secondly, if there is something which you have shared with, uh, not just publicly making it available, uh, but in different ways, um, then, uh, which means sharing with specific institutions, you notify them in relation to that particular data set. But if it is an open data set, I think it's um, uh, almost impossible to be retracted. In that sense, um, if, if something is being uh, released under um, an open license, uh, similarly to the function of the copyright, symmetrically speaking, um, it's going to be impossible to retract it. So this is something that the data subject needs to know or you need to have assessed as a risk when you make the original publication. Of course, that depends on your legal basis as well. Thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, specifically addressed to Prodromos. Uh, how to obtain proper legal basi basis for using data collected from social media and research when informed consent from individual data subject is not possible? Okay, that's again a very good question. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, it is probably not going to be possible, especially if you're working with uh, uh, any kind of uh, large data set collection. Um, so there you have to see whether your public interest legal basis could actually, you can get away with this, uh, which means you have to anonymize uh, the data as much as possible. Um, and to this as much as possible, it has to do with the purpose of your research. So if your research in itself does not allow you to pseudonymize it or to anonymize, then you have to figure out um, a way to at least notify. So even if you don't obtain a consent, you should have some kind of notification. And this could be even in the form of a public announcement if you cannot really contact each and every individual, which is very likely you won't be able to do so. Um, so I would suggest as a, as a basics, um, the public uh, interest one, since you, it's not possible for you to obtain uh, consent. And I would say I would prefer that from the legal interest one, uh, if I were to substantiate it uh, adequately, which means in relation to the objectives of my research, the mission of my institution, and uh, as this is described in statutory documents or other provisions, if it is public uh, law provisions, if it's a public research institution. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question related to public interest and how to prove that something is public interest and is reuse of the data in health research, combining the research data from various studies to make data a stronger uh, public interest by default or some criteria has to be fulfilled? Um, I don't know, again, because it relates it slightly, I mentioned that in the previous uh, question, the public interest has to be substantiated uh, specifically. So it's not a generic, like a blanket uh, legal basis. So you need to see what is the nature of your institution and the nature of your processing in order to be able to justify that something is public interest. If you come from an institution that has a, a public remit, a public task remit by itself, that's a first criterion if, uh, met, but it's not necessarily the only one. Then you have to go and see what is the research you're doing and to what extent can be classified as public interest. And in that sense, to make the, your classification of uh, public interest. Now, in, in relation to the combination of multiple um, uh, data sets from the health sector, I think that's even more, it's even more important to justify why this in that particular instance 
it justifies the public interest. Though, of course, it's much easier um, to justify uh, such type of research as public interest compared to other types of uh, research. But we shouldn't just think in terms of um, public benefit, uh, right? It is public interest. So it means that it, it, most of uh, research institutions would probably be able uh, to justify it, provided they have a, a consistent uh, description and justification of what they're researching. And that's why DNP is so important. Um, so next question, um, the freedom of the arts and sciences is written in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and therefore is a fundamental right guaranteed to everybody. Is performing scientific research then not in itself always a legitimate interest in the sense of Article 6 GDPR? <clears throat> Uh, Jack, do you want me to take yeah. it? Do you I can attempt to answer this question. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, I'm not as familiar with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a lawyer, but when I, I have, have looked into legitimate interests of the controller quite uh, a lot, and I've seen, I've tried to see how it is that it can be applied to to be used for research, um, for research in general. Now, something that I've that I found when you want to apply legitimate interests. It cannot simply be that I have a legitimate interest and therefore I can use it, but you have to take into account a lot the user and you also have to look into the data subject and think, would he expect me to be using this data for this particular purpose as well? And then from there, you have to make sure that you have good documentation as to why you believe that um, your interest outweighs the rights and freedoms or the right to privacy, let's say. Uh, or let's say just say the rights of your data subjects. So there's an extra addendum to that, that you have to make sure that it does not get outweighed by their own uh, rights. And I think this is where uh, the discussion really begins. I don't know if Podromos you wanna to add to that. Yeah, just pretty much, I'm not really in the substance, just a, um, uh, as I said in my presentation, I think legitimate interest is like a poisonous fruit. It, it seems so easy to actually use it as a, as a legal basis, but it's not. You have to be uh, very diligent as to how you document uh, why you have a legitimate interest. Uh, and precisely because this, is, this balancing exercise has to uh, be made, uh, you require some kind of at least legally, some legal uh, implications uh, assessment. You, you need to have, um, so it, it means quite a bit of hard work. So, I'm not sure it's, it's the best uh, legal basis you could use. Yeah, agreed. If you want uh, a fundamental right uh, uh, answer, which it's repeating and confirming what Jacques and Pro just said, uh, by constant case law of the Court of Justice, none of the fundamental rights in the Charter are absolute, but all of them uh, have to be weighted against each other. So how to weight uh, uh, the right to scientific research with the right of uh, um, protection of personal autonomy and, 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 and privacy? Well, in the way in which it has been uh, established by the EU legislator in the GDPR. So that, you know, the GDPR, what we're discussing is that balance. So that is how you would answer this from a fundamental right point of view. Um, okay, um, so do you have any recommendations or guidance on how to best uh, obtain consent for data sharing, especially if data will be shared in a repository and the intention is that the data could be reused by any interested party? How do you fully inform the data subject without overwhelming them with too much information? Yeah, so this is this this is an issue, right? So you know, you sh the way you go about actually being able to share data is by informing uh, as much as possible everything that uh, is planned for this particular data. And of course, you don't know what it's going to be used for. So how much can you actually say? Um, so the idea is to just show the intent and also show what you're doing to protect them uh, when this data becomes out there and let them know that at once this data is published, yes, it, it is out of your control uh, what is going to be done with it, but hopefully 
the privacy measures that you've put in are enough to protect uh, to protect them. Now, when you're providing information, something that is allowed in the GDPR is also to layer the information. Now, when you have your informed consent form, you want to keep it concise because this allows this also makes it less uh, less ambiguous. But if a data subject wants to be further informed, let's say of all of their rights, for example, uh, you can put links and provide extra information available for them should they choose to uh, want to be informed more. And this is one of the ways that I usually, uh, or at the university, we recommend researchers, if they have a public website or if they have somewhere, to keep some of this information, sort of a privacy and notice that all data subjects can go to and will cover uh, a lot of the rights and, and all of the information. So this is one way in which you can layer this information in the informed consent and not making it look, as I said, like a, like a bio. And also a further question addressed to, um, to Jacques in relation to your um, specific certification in, in privacy. Um, what certification do you have and uh, would you recommend it to research data support staff members uh, helping researchers with uh, sharing personal data? Right, so I have a um, CIPPE, which means Certified Information Privacy Professional from, in Europe. Now, this was uh, a certification that I obtained from the IAPP, which is just simply this organization that is for privacy professionals. Um, I do recommend that if you're planning to, uh, to delve into this a lot further, I found from my perspective, it's, uh, it was necessary because quite honestly, a lot of um, researchers require this kind of expertise and it's not an expertise that is, it's sort of new, at least in the sense that people are realizing how important it is. That being said, it's, it does take, um, it's, you gotta take a test for it. It's not the easiest test, it's very, it's worded for lawyers. So um, do take your time in studying it. And they do offer a lot of different services. I personally simply uh, bought the textbook and then uh, took the exam and I just read the textbook and basically memorized it. Uh, but it's very informative and it doesn't just apply to research. So you will be learning about other things that are well beyond what you would need from research, but it does give you a lot of uh, confidence when you're gonna be speaking to researchers about these topics. So I would recommend it, but make sure that you're willing to put the investment in it. Yes, thank you. Uh, we also have a, a comment stating that some countries have specified uh, in national legislation what legal basis for handling of uh, personal data may apply to, for example, universities and um, research institutions. Um, to make it uh, easier. I was wondering whether maybe Thomas or Prodromos would like to say something in relation to the national legislation and what happens in also in the context of uh, um, um, collaborations uh, in, in European projects. <clears throat> in terms of personal rights, indeed some legislations have provided more specific um, um, either classification of the scientific research, normally they would put it under public interest, or they um, uh, they consider that as a, as a uh, self-standing um, legal basis. And I think, of course, this makes things clearer. But uh, it's not the same across the union. Now, when we have a consortium, as mentioned uh, during the presentation, and uh, it was also covered partially, at least by Jack as well. Um, you have to see who is the um, processor and who is the controller in each particular reset scenario. Um, normally, uh, we, we go back to the work packages and see, or the consortium agreement, and we see, first of all, who has the main, uh, who defines the purposes and the means for the um, data processing, and that's the controller. If there are multiple ones, but they equally define um, different, let's say, stages in the life cycle of personal data processing, they're again co-controllers. Uh, if you have some organizations uh, doing that on behalf of others, then they are processors, but we are, this is unlikely uh, to see in the context of a consortium. 
Um, and of course, it's very different when you have the commission or a private uh, funder or another funder um, to actually ask you to do a specific, to perform a specific type of research and there you act as a, as a processor. In all cases, you may have multiple uh, countries and multiple entities uh, performing the processing. You, that's why it is important when you do, and the commission asks you to do that, when you do the ethics and data protection impact assessment, or at least the uh, DMP at the beginning, uh, to actually um, have a, a clear understanding who's processing data uh, from the partners, under which conditions and terms, what purpose for, what are the legal basis, and how this is um, uh, done in a, in a legal and ethical manner. And again, I, I will repeat something that uh, Jack said multiple times. Um, it's these two things are parallel. They, they are successive layers. It has to be GDPR compliance, compliant. It has to be ethic uh, committee or ethics committees uh, complied. And normally the commission would ask for at least one uh, ethics committee or at least one DPO to provide um, a kind of a letter or um, some kind of uh, uh, statements in relation to the legal and ethical status of the project in relation with respect to its data uh, processing practices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that we have answered all questions. So, um, Gwen, any final comments? No, not at all. Just that we are uh, uploading the presentations to the portal uh, and the recordings uh, this evening or tomorrow morning. So, if you want to revisit this web webinar, please uh, take a look there. And uh, maybe also, Marina, we can mention that we have um, we will certainly have some follow-up webinars on this topic, maybe some more specific or some more example-based. Uh, judging from the comments we're getting in the survey, uh, which is still open, uh, I think there's a big need for this. So we'll definitely try to follow this up. And if that's uh, going to be the final word, I would just like to thank very much to the speakers, uh, Thomas Margoni, Pradovan Stiavos and Jacques Flores to uh, take the time to present uh, this topic uh, twice uh, over, the, <laughs> over the last week. It's a very complicated topic, so uh, I would really express our gratitude for them to take the time and to make, uh, make sure that, that we have very good presentations. Um, that we will be able to share afterwards and use afterwards as well. So, and I would like to thank you as well, all of you uh, participants, uh, for being in such a, um, a large attendance. Um, everybody uh, stay safe and healthy, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in the next, uh, uh, next uh, presentation or webinar. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks.